We live in a fast-moving world. All around us, the most extraordinary processes. With access to some of the most fascinating factories, I take you behind the scenes to reveal their production secrets. From craft workshops to international industries. Join me, Francesca Chiarando, as we explore the world's ultimate processes. Welcome to Ireland, a country where they've got one creative industry down to a truly fine art. This is Waterford, the oldest city in Ireland. It was established by Viking raiders well over a thousand years ago. Today, in rather more peaceful times, Waterford is best known as the home to one of the world's finest crystal manufacturers where they make some of the most beautiful and delicate handcrafted objects in the world. Yes, in this smashing programme, we're focusing on the process of high-class glass making. This exquisite cut crystal might look fragile and dainty, but the processes involved are fast, fiery and, frankly, terrifying. It's forged in an inferno, Furnaces blaze at 1,400 degrees. Blisteringly hot glass flows freely. Flames leap from the tools in your hand. And despite the heat and the fire, what's happening here is actually rigorously controlled. Making hand-cut crystal is the ultimate in precision craftsmanship. Every step of the process demands perfection. It takes a light touch, a steady hand, extreme patience. And if after all those hours of hard work there's one tiny mistake, at least there's a very satisfying solution. <laughs> Smashing. The Waterford Crystal Factory was first established way back in 1783. Today, it employs around 80 full-time craftsmen. 45,000 pieces of high-quality crystal are blown and cut from 750 tonnes of lead crystal every year. Incredibly, nearly every item made here in Ireland is crafted by hand. Ulrich Gardieu thinks this is the key to Waterford's enduring success. The secret is, I believe, it's authenticity. And I do think when you see the real thing, you don't question at any time the quality and the design, the efforts being behind these products. But despite the dependence on traditional manufacturing methods, inevitably 21st century technology has crept in here and there. It's finding the right merge of, of doing things by hand as well as using the latest technology to create the best possible uh, quality products. Waterford Crystal is shipped all over the world, with the US by far the biggest export market. It graces some of the world's most important places, from the White House to Westminster Abbey. With a catalogue of hundreds of patterns and styles, there are many different processes. But in this episode, I'm going to follow the journey of just one creation. A work of art which tells the story of how this company makes the most of craft processes. This is the Dungarvan 14-inch vase, and it's one of the factory's most popular pieces. It's a complex work which involves many different skills, such as glass blowing, molding, and intricate cutting. We're going to follow it right through the production process. The 
the story of how a piece of Waterford crystal begins starts at the drawing board. This is the design office, where new patterns and products begin their journey. Matt Kehoe is Waterford's design director. There's a team of us. We have five designers, including myself, and we have a technical drafts person. And the word team is the operative word. We work as a team. And what we do, initially, we sketch on a piece of paper, thumbnail sketches, and we, we, we can sketch for, for a few days, do a little bit of research. Then we go to CAD and we refine the, the design a little bit more so that enables us to make it into production, into manufacture. CAD, or computer-aided design, helps the designers accurately map out their visions. Matt's pioneered some of Waterford's most innovative new products but some of the older designs are still firm favourites. Lismore is the oldest pattern still going, designed in 1952. It's also by far the most popular. Another traditional pattern, the one I'm following, is Dungarvan. It was also first designed in 1952, but updated and brought into production in 1986. It was one of the patterns that was kind of dormant for a long time and hadn't been seen. So we brought it out. It was a kind of a daring pattern, but it was a very sparkly pattern. And it's done quite well today, as it has that kind of a retro feel. And people have uh, kind of a, an affection for it because it has that sparkle and has that kind of, we could say, quality design. Described as a contemporary classic pattern. Very much up to date type of pattern for Waterford, but stays within the DNA and that has that touch of tradition to it as well, so it caters for everybody. So where better to show off this pattern than on one of the biggest pieces? A 5.8 kilogram, 35 and a half centimetre tall vase. This beautiful piece has its beginnings far away from the showroom lights, in an industrial warehouse. Here, one-ton bags of raw materials are stored, ready to use. Perhaps surprisingly, the crystal mix isn't clear, but red and gritty. It's a mix of just three ingredients. Silica sand, potash, that's a potassium salt, and a lead compound called litharge. It's amazing to think that something so beautiful is made from such a simple recipe. But there is one extra ingredient which is added to the mix. This is colored or broken crystal. All of Waterford's waste crystal is recycled. This is efficient, of course, but there's also a more practical purpose. The colour melts quickly, which helps fuse the raw ingredients into a molten mass. The cullet, which starts out as large broken pieces of crystal, is ground to a fine finish. Then, bags of cullet and raw ingredients are hoisted up onto a high platform. Up here, they're emptied into a giant mixing machine. Beneath the platform, the materials pour into giant bags in perfect proportions. 70% cullet to 30% raw materials. With the ingredients weighed, measured, and good to go, it's time to put this recipe in the oven. This building is home to the creative heart of Waterford Crystal. Inside is what they call the hot end. This is where furnaces and kilns blaze away all day long, and molten crystal pours from taps. The main furnace sits high above the factory floor, Raw ingredients slowly tumble into the scorching oven at a rate of two and a half tons every 24 hours. It maintains a face-meltingly fierce temperature of 1,400 degrees all day, 365 days a year. It's simply too inefficient to ever let it cool down. They use an electric arc furnace rather than a blast furnace. Down on the factory floor, molten crystal from the furnace pours like syrup into metal jars called billets. 
one by one, they're plucked out and put to work. Then, a frankly terrifying ballet plays out, as the craftsmen neatly dodge, weave and sidestep around each other. All while carrying crystal five times hotter than the average oven. Tony Cody, manager of the Hot End, tries to reassure me. Is this process dangerous? Uh, I, it is, it is. Uh, but we don't, we don't have many accidents here. Okay. Very rarely have accidents. Uh, and that's because all these guys are very experienced guys. Like, some have 40 years experience and are so used to the, to the process. And it's uh, routine enough. You know, you walk the same way, you come out with the, with the glass the same way, the molded glass the same way. So it is dangerous, but we don't have a lot of accidents. Experience isn't just the key to avoiding a nasty burn. It's the foundation on which Waterford's business is built. Do you need a lot of experience to be a glass blower? The apprenticeship is for five years, OK, and that, that kind of gets you through the basics. <laughs> but in order to, to be a master craftsman, and that's what most of these lads are. It takes about seven years. Seven years. Oh, really, yeah. We make some uh, trophies there, and they're very intricate. And there's a lot of knowledge. There's a lot of skill. You know, and the knowledge, a lot of these lads, they're, they're, they're the fathers would have working in the, in the glass industry. Like, you know, there's a lot of second generation guys really? here. So it's, uh, it goes it's back a down. long, long time, like, yeah. Today, the blowers are putting all that experience to good use and making the piece I'm here to see. What are you making here today? Today we have on a 14-inch vase here. This particular pattern is a Dungarvan pattern, and as you can see, that's the shape of it. It might be hard to, 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 <laughs> to, to, to pick out the shape now when it says on the drawing. But that's the shape, that's the cut that goes onto it. Each one of these lines here is a cut, and it's a big vase. Yeah. Takes a lot of skill. Uh, again, hand-eye coordination is uh, very important. So the shape of the vase is made here, and then the cuts are done later on? The cuts are done later on, yes. Yeah. The process of making the vase begins with the simplest of tools, a puff of air. The technique that they use here at Waterford is called mouth blowing. This means the glass is first inflated by breath whilst at 1400 degrees Celsius. It's then dropped into a mould, which ensures all the pieces are the same shape and size. The professionals make it look easy, but now I want to have a go. It's in at the deep end, or rather, in at the hot end. We walk away, yeah? Adrian no, Tutty, a master blower with 40 years' experience, agrees to show me the ropes. I'm just taking this hot iron here, Francesco, OK? The heated blowing rod is used to pluck the crystal from See the metal vat, it where it has been cooling. Watch the stone, it's going to come up. Go on, step hard. That's it, and again, and again. OK, I'll take it now. We go over this way. Adrian then takes the cool crystal and plunges it into a small furnace to bring the temperature back up. Do you want to try twisting this for a while, if you can see it? Look, look over the blue glass. You see it? Uh-huh. Just twist it nice and gently. It heats up gradually. I'm going to leave you on your own now. Oh, no! <laughs> All right, I'll take it for now. Now, back up to temperature, it's pliable okay. enough to work oh. with. Just wrap it around it. How? Yeah, well, I'm going to show you. Put your hand on it here. First, we shape it with wooden tools. Give it down a bit, yeah. That's it. Do it fine. OK, leave that one down now. Use that one. Let's put it around. That's it. I'll go back to the end of the iron and give it a blow. Back here, yeah? Let's lift it up a bit, yeah? Nice and easy, now. It's hard to blow that first breath in. <laughs> but a little goes a long way. That's it. Go on, keep going. Go on. Yes. Go on. <laughs> Once inside, air heats up and expands, and the crystal just keeps growing. That's OK. I think it might be time to stop before the whole thing explodes. Now, now have, a look, have a look at your piece. Oh I enjoyed that so much. It's so nice to see something, you actually making something. 
but it's a proper craft process. I love it. Absolutely love it. I'm not sure what it is, but it's all my own work. Now I've mastered the art of blowing crystal, I think it's time to take on the big boys and have a go at making a Dungarvan vase. Weighing nearly six kilograms and standing at over 35 centimeters tall, it's a big piece. And unlike my abstract fishbowl, this one comes with a set of very specific rules. This is a much larger piece now, Francesca. Yeah. Much, much larger. Come on, come over here. Just try. Okay. Go on. See how heavy it is? Yeah. Okay, I got it there. It's so much bigger. No problem. Again, the crystal goes into a furnace to heat up, but this time there's a lot more of it. How big is this compared to the piece we did before? The piece this morning was roughly about two kg. This is up around nine kg. Nine. Yeah. So an extra seven. How much does the biggest piece you do weigh? Some of the pieces, they can make up to about 13 kg. It is very, very seldom they would make those. They're special orders now. Is there only certain people that can work up to that weight? We've chosen a few, like myself. <laughs> <laughs> when the crystal really starts to melt, it's time to get it out. So you just learn by experience. Experience, when yeah. It's ready to yeah. Come Somebody would say to you, "How do you know? Do you know? Uh, you know by this when you're starting to twist faster." Yeah. Now I'm just going to bring this one out. Now, okay. Okay. Next, we have to mould it into shape, which takes a surprising amount of force. Push, like having a baby. I've never had one. <laughs> the shaping tools are crafted by the workers themselves, made the same way they were two centuries ago. Just to get a more rounded shape on it like that. Made from wood, they have a limited life. Oh! Just give it a go there. A little puff of breath creates a bubble inside then it's back into the furnace for a 15-second blast of heat. Now we're ready to go again. In just those few seconds, the bubble expanded and the vase doubled in size. Now the shape is finessed using another simple tool, a wad of wet newspaper. This allows the blower to mould the crystal in a more tactile way, like a potter does with clay. Why you go with the paper? Yeah. A little bit further. Yeah. See, it's the way it's stretching now. Yeah, you don't really off. blow much on this one. No. That's because of the heat. The vase is now ready to be plunged into the mold. By pushing down hard, it's forced to fill the shape. Right. Just twist it up side side. You can blow into it now. Go nice and easy. Another puff of air inflates the vase to fit. That's it. Keep it moving. Just like that? Yeah. The vase is constantly rotated so it doesn't stick to the sides. It's quite tough to turn. It's hard work on the arms. Yeah. OK, I'll take you down. Finally, Adrian is happy. We're finished. They open the mould and extract the newly minted vase. Now, here you go. Trying to give it a twist. Twisting helps straighten out any kinks. When they spot a bend, the twisting stops to let gravity pull the vase down. Well, you think it's bend, you just stop it. That's it. No! But there's a little finishing up to do. Right now, 20 to 30% of the glass is actually excess and must be removed. It's sprayed with cold water causing the hot glass to neatly fracture, severing the cap. Just like that. Just like that. Finally, the vase is placed into a kiln at 450 degrees, which will gradually cool over the next 10 hours. The manager explains why it ends up in an oven to cool down. So when the glass goes into the kiln, the temperature's raised, and then overnight it's lowered, so it's cooled down. Yeah, room temperature, yeah. Why, why is it done like this? If we left the glass just there without putting the kiln, the outside will cool quicker than the inside. Uh -huh. That puts stress in the glass. It'll cause an explosion and it'll really? just break. Yeah. The stress will look for the weakest part of the glass and it'll explode. But when it goes into the kiln, by bringing it down gradually to room temperature, the stress comes out of the glass. So you're, 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 cooling, you're cooling the whole glass down evenly. 
With the glass cooling in the kiln, the work of the hot end is done. There's real skill involved in blowing these vases. No wonder they're proud of what they produce. There's a lot of passion and pride in it, like, you know, if you look at the lads making the glass there, the sweat goes into that, like, you know, and that's putting it bluntly. So there's a lot of pride in what they, what they do. Talking of pride, I'm glad to see they've held on to my masterpiece. Hey, Francesca, uh, we'd like to present this piece to you on behalf of Waterford Crystal, all the lads here. Uh, a special design piece uh, made, made by yourself and designed by yourself. I got one of the master uh, craftsmen to have a look at it and see uh, what kind of score he give you. Okay. He said that he'd give you a six out of ten out of it. A six? Yeah, so which is quite good. Oh. And, the and the kind of things he was looking for is the thickness. And it was very, very well done. Okay. Yeah, well done. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I'm not sure what it is. It's either a light bulb or a fish bulb. It might not be the best, but I'm very happy with it. It's better than I expected. I've been literally blown away by this process. Red Hot Crystal is mesmerizing, and the skills and coordination of the craftsmen are spellbinding to watch. That's why, in 2010, Waterford decided to open up the factory to visitors. Since then, over a million people have passed through the doors. A few lucky ones, like me, get to have a go. With mixed success. <laughs> But there's no doubt that for visitors, actually seeing the craftsmen at work increases the crystal's appeal. I think when you walk around in the factory, you, you can feel the passion and you can feel the proudness which our craftsmen have for Waterford. You know we are talking about 233 years of history. So the passion and, and respect for the DNA, for our heritage, is really what makes our product so unique. But now, back at the hot end, the pressure's on, and they're about to turn up the heat. Set your stopwatch, because you're about to witness one of the fastest precision processes I've ever seen. Back on the factory floor, having fulfilled today's quota of huge vases, the blowers have switched to a product close to my heart, wine glasses. Waterford's famous wine glasses seem like timeless and eternal objects. Yet their production is fast and dynamic, a race against the clock. Apprentices and master craftsmen must work together as a team to strike whilst the glass is hot. First, the blower gathers glass from a small furnace by hand, judging the amount by eye. He rolls it in something called a steel marva to shape it, then blows it into a small sphere. He takes it to a holding rack, twisting it constantly to stop the soft glass distorting, then hangs it back by the furnace. A second blower picks up the rod, dips it back into the furnace, gathering a second load of glass. Next, he uses wooden tools to shape the glowing bulb before blowing it into a long oval. He uses gravity to help elongate the shape, then drops it into a mold. What emerges will become the cup of the wine glass. The rod is returned to the holding rack. Now the stem is added. One blower drips a blob of hot glass onto the bottom of the cup. Another uses tools to lengthen and draw out the stem. Waste glass on the blowing rod is chopped off and dropped into a box of cullet. Finally, it's time for the base. Another blob of crystal is added, then smoothed and flattened out to form a disc shape. And 
the class is complete. After a short rest on a holding rack, it's turned in a hot flame to ensure the three parts have annealed together before dropping onto a conveyor belt. At the other end, it's picked up, checked for quality, then loaded into the kiln to slowly cool. Each glass has taken only about two minutes to make. This is a design that Waterford have been making for over a hundred years. They guarantee that they will never stop production. You won't find this design on the shelves. It has to be commissioned through the Archive Stemware service. But this means if you break one of your hundred-year-old crystal heirlooms, it can be replaced. Obviously, the workmanship involved makes this wine glass a cut above. But what's the difference between a crystal goblet like this and a plain old glass one? Hot end manager Tony shows me just how different they are. Tony, how can I tell the difference between glass and crystal? Good question. If you lift up both, both of these glasses, OK, and the other one as well, can you feel a difference in that? This one's a lot heavier. Yeah, yeah. Now, another little clue. You leave the glasses down. You just give them a little thing there, both of them. And do the same with this one. Ah, oh, that one rings and that one... Yeah, there's dumps. that little ping you always get out of the crystal glass. Yeah. Another little uh, secret is if you lift up this glass here and look through it, hold it up to the light. Not very clear, is it? No. If you lift up the crystal glass and hold it to the light, you can see the clarity there, the colour in it. Yeah, it's really clear. From that, we can tell this is crystal. So what is it that you do that makes the crystal so much better? Oh, it's, uh, it's the ingredients. Uh, we would uh, add uh, litarch, uh, potash and uh, silica sand. Ordinary glass is made from silica, otherwise known as sand. Its melting point is over 1,700 degrees but potash and litharge reduce that to 1,400. Which allows the master blowers to, to, to shape the glass, to work with it, uh, and also it makes the crystal uh, very soft for the master cutters to get these intricate cuts on it. Adding litharge or lead oxide also changes the refractive the index color. of silica glass. That it's means when it's here. cut, you get a lot more mm -hmm. rainbow sparkle. Crystal has a different recipe. Absolutely. Glass. Absolutely. And although it looks similar, yeah. it's actually totally different. Completely different. As we demonstrated here today. <laughs> this combination of ingredients creates utterly clear, heavy, sparkling crystal with a distinctive ring. And it's those qualities that matter to Waterford. back on the factory floor. After 10 hours of warming down, it's time to open the kilns and take out the vases. They look good to me, but are they good enough for Waterford? Every piece of Waterford must meet the highest standards. Flawed pieces never make it to the end of the production line as quality is checked at every step. If a defect is found, the piece is discarded. I can barely even see what's wrong with this one. But I'm assured that it doesn't meet Waterford's high standards. So here goes. In fact, the generous folks of Waterford have saved me all the week's rejects to smash. So it's heartbreaking to destroy all this hard work. This is kind of satisfying. Only 4% of all pieces are junked at this stage proof of the blower's exceptional skill. Down in quality control, the 14-inch vases are sent for the chop, this time in a good way. The narrow tops are removed using a fine diamond saw, creating a wide, flare-shaped vase. Next up, they're polished to take off any sharp edges and reveal any flaws. 
the vase is washed and then thoroughly inspected. If it doesn't make the cut, it's marked up as a reject. There's no way back. This crystal crashes out of the competition. With the hot work over, the second phase of crystal craftsmanship begins. This is where the cutting happens, and overseeing the daily grind is Tony Grant. I'm the production manager of what we call the pole end of the factory. So really what we do is we take the blank crystal from the hot end, and from there on we create all the patterns of what the customer needs right through to the finished process here. Tony manages the team here and a hectic production schedule. But we probably do maybe 100 to 150 type of uh, products every week. And the craftsmen have to remember all of these? Yes. Most of the craftsmen would have memory of maybe 100 to 150 different types of patterns. Yeah. Wow, OK. Yeah. So all the craftsmen here, then, they will know the actual pattern that's going on it and be able to cut this from memory. But before the cutting begins, the blank vase forged in the hot end must be marked up. Geometric patterns of vertical lines are drawn onto each piece using a temporary marker. Simple mechanical tools steady the craftsman's arm and help him measure precisely the cutting points. Next, the small horizontal lines are added. He has no need to make exact measurements or refer back to a diagram. He knows the pattern off by heart. If he was marking up an unusual piece, one he hasn't committed to memory, he can refer to this archive. These shells contain the marked-up patterns of nearly all the shapes that Waterford has ever produced, from simple wine glasses to elaborate trophies. Next, the process moves into the cutting room. In here, teams of master cutters carve away at the crystal blanks. It's these cuts that give the products their sparkle. How many different types of cuts are there? Okay, we probably have in excess of 30 to 40 different types of cuts, but we have two distinct teams of people here. And if I could just demonstrate, on the crystal decanter here, if you can see, this is probably called the wedge cutting, which is the deep V cuts that goes into the crystal. Okay. And they, that's done by a team of wedge cutters. And then on the top of the counter, we have what we call the flat cut. Okay. So it's a different skill and a different skill level. Yeah, and we have a different team, actually, that train up to do all the flat cutting. Okay. So even though we have many different types of cuts, it, these are the two basics, wedge and flat cut. So wedge cutters never cut flat, and flat cutters never cut wedge. Wedge cuts are used on almost everything, whereas flat cutting is used mainly on stemware and decanters. But both cutters use the same kind of tools, grinding wheels embedded with diamond grit, one of the hardest materials on earth. There are about 30 different sizes and grades of wheel, from 2.5 to 30 centimetres in diameter. A constant stream of water lubricates the wheels and carries away the ground glass. The wheels are sharpened using sticks of aluminium oxide, another very hard material. The cutters sit on lopsided stools, propping them forwards at the perfect angle. They need to be comfortable because this is not fast work. How long does it take to complete a large item like the Dungarvan vase? The Dungarvan vase would probably take roughly four and a half to five and a half hours wow. to complete. All by, hand? All by hand. Oh, wow. All by hand. I think it's about time I tried out this process for myself. Though I think I'll start with something a little simpler and lighter than the Dungarvan vase. Okay, I have my white coat on. Yep. We're here in the cutting department. Ready to go. I'd like to give it a go if I can. Right. What we're going to do, Francesca, right? I'm going to mark out pattern on this tumbler, right? The Lismore pattern, it's one of the famous patterns. It's now 64 years in production. And it's still one of the best-selling patterns in the world. Really? 
Francesca, what we'll do now is we'll put the 16 pint star on the end. Mm -hmm. Just mark it out. So we're just dividing the glass into equal parts. And this is what we're going to make you attempt to kind of create when we're finished. <laughs> it looks complicated. So if you look through there, you can see the design coming onto it. With the pattern marked out, it's time to check out the tools. Can you see the way the diamond wheel is shaped like kind of a V? Yeah. So the center point oh. is where you will, the glass will hit the wheel. The wheel itself, even though it will cut into the crystal, it won't cut you. Do you want to just rub your hand on it there and just show you? Oh. Well, it won't bite. <laughs> That's it. See how soft it is? <laughs> see how soft it is? Yeah. That's so weird. Very good, yeah. Like a nail file, gently touching the diamond embedded wheel won't harm your fingers. But add pressure and it will grind hard, brittle materials. What you're going to do is you put two elbows down on the sponges, right? And you hold the glass just like this. Ah, so you can see. You can see through it. And then what you're going to try to do then is the center point of the wheel slowly in. And when it hits the wheel, just rest it and put a slight bit of pressure and then move forwards and backwards on it. How do you know how hard to press? Again, that comes with experience and the feel of the crystal. Tony makes eight straight and perfect cuts across the bottom of the glass, carving out a neat 16-point star. Hi, right, Francesca, that's the finished piece. Wow, and that's all done by It's all eye. done by eye. How about you having a go? <laughs> yeah. Yeah? I'd love Very to. good, very good. Time to get my nose to the grindstone. If I just guide you in on the first yeah. cut, okay? That's it. Now just lean a little bit of pressure and slow movement on it. It's a bit wobbly. Perfect. No, that's fine. Now turn around to make it a square. That's it. You're getting there. <laughs> You're doing okay. well. You're doing well. Okay, Press pressure. more than two-thirds deep and the crystal then could shatter. And but if you don't press hard enough, it won't sparkle. Perfect. It's hard to hit the centre, isn't it? It is. It is. Keep going back, keep hitting the bottom. Okay. Plus, all the cuts must be evenly spaced and meet exactly in the centre to achieve that star effect. Very good. Perfect. Oh, that one's wider. Do it. Well. It's really good fun. Yeah. It might not look it on my face, but it is really good fun. <laughs> the concentration on your face. <laughs> Intense. <laughs> That's it. Keep running. Oh, excellent. And then by the again. Last one. That's it. It gets more difficult yeah. every cut that goes into it. You're doing well though. I can slight bit pressure. Right, let's have a look and see how you are next apprentice then. Last line done and my glass is that still is intact. Quite good now. <laughs> that is quite good. But when it comes to quality, did I make the cut? That's excellent actually. <laughs> very, very good. Thank you. Very good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's my glass. I'm pretty proud to be honest. It was it was actually really hard, but it was really good fun. And the pressure was definitely on, but my God, that is satisfying to see that. I love it. Show them how good that you got the centre. <laughs> very, very good. Apparently, I got the centre. <laughs> I'm pretty pleased with my handiwork. There's something satisfying about crafting an object like this entirely by hand. But in the corner of the cutting room, I spy something a little unexpected. Heretical, even. Machines. These are six-axis grinding machines. That means the diamond wheels can be moved into almost any position. They're overseen by Alan O'Keefe, a second-generation master cutter who trained for a further two years just to learn how to operate these machines. But the question is, what are they doing here? I was quite surprised to see a machine doing some of the work in here. Why is it that you use machines? Uh, just some of the, the, the patterns that we have nowadays, uh, they're so complicated, they're just not possible to do by hand. These machines can do a very elaborate design, something that uh, requires symmetry. This is a good example. 
where you have two double circles. Very difficult to do, even by hand to draw two circles perfectly would be very difficult to do, but for the machine it would be absolutely accurate. This part of the pattern is called a stone cut. Again, all the cuts must be exactly the same depth and, and point exactly uh, into each other. But again, very difficult by hand. And in the centre we have a 32 point star, which would all run into the centre into a pinpoint. Again, very difficult to do by hand, but not for the machine. So with the use of the machines, you're able to make much more complex and intricate designs. Exactly. So why don't you use machines for everything? Because we choose not to do that. Uh, our customers demand that we have um, um, a handmade product. So as much as possible, we will do it by hand. 95% of the products in this factory are made completely by hand, and the other 5% will use part of the pattern, we'll use it in the machine. Pieces such as the Dungarvan vase take around five hours to cut by hand. Surely using machines could speed up the process. The machine is not any faster because we have the same wheel in the machine that we use by hand, so you're governed by how much the wheel can take away on the glass. So it's not really any faster, but where you will gain a bit of time is with the, with the fatigue factor. Like this is a very heavy piece. To hold this for three or four hours, you can only do a little bit, put it down, pick it up, do another bit, whereas the machine won't get tired. With large production pieces weighing upwards of 15 kilograms, it pays to let a machine take the strain. But Waterford remains committed to their centuries-long tradition of handcrafted crystal. And nowhere is that more obvious than in the glitzy realm of prestige production. Waterford makes many special pieces, like trophies, awards, and sculptures. Each one starts out with a custom-made mold. Most of the molds used for the more popular pieces are made from steel. When it comes to special one-off commissions, the craftsmen turn to more traditional methods. These molds are carved from wood the same way molds would have been made over two centuries ago. They're often made from beech, which can withstand very high temperatures. But even so, they only last a week until they're completely burnt out. The molds are still made in a traditional way. First, a chunk of wood is cut down to size using a bandsaw. Then, the block is transferred to a wood-turning lathe. It's hollowed out using a long wood chisel. Every few minutes, the craftsman compares the shape he's made to a simple paper template. Finally, the finished article is sliced in half. It will be hinged and a handle added, then it's ready to use. Once each special piece has been molded in wood, it's marked and cut by hand. The piece might also be engraved. Tiny copper wheels are used to gently graze the surface, leaving behind a pattern. This type of engraving is called intaglio, meaning reverse. The deeper the engraver grinds into the surface, the more prominent the object appears. An engraved piece like this the Four Seasons Bowl represents 20 hours, or up to three days' work. And there are many other special pieces out on display for visitors to admire. This is the People's Choice Award, given to the stars of stage, screen and music. Sadly, it's not mine. It's just one of the many special commissions and trophies that Waterford make. Every year, they craft 100 of these People's Choice Awards. Each one takes five days to make. But that's nothing compared to some of the ornate trophies on display. For every unique piece, there's always a replica made and stored here in case the original gets broken. But there's something really special over there that's caught my eye. This sculpture of the World Trade Center was made by a craftsman using new pieces and offcuts from the recycle bin. It took him over 200 hours of his own time. It's testament to the skill of Waterford's craftsmen that an artwork so intricate can be fashioned from brittle, 
unbreakable crystal. Back on the production line, our Dungarvan vase is virtually finished. It emerges from an acid bath which polishes up the crystal surface. Next, it's checked once again for quality. If judged to have the slightest imperfection, even at this late stage, it's rejected. Sadly, this one's crashing out, destined for the cullet bin. But the next one is pure perfection. The Waterford logo is sandblasted onto the bottom and a ribbon is added to the piece. Finally, it's wrapped and boxed up, ready to be shipped out to the customers. It's taken 16 and a half hours work, but there's no question the end result is worth it. We've explored every corner of the Waterford workshop and followed their incredible processes. From mold making to blowing, quality control to cutting. And the results of all this hard work are on display here. 1,000 square meters in size. It's home to the largest collection of Waterford crystal on earth. There are some eye-wateringly expensive pieces in here such as this 40,000 euro sculpted coach and horses. I can't deny, walking around here makes me a little nervous. Everywhere you look, the skills of Waterford's craftsmen are on display. From globes to Christmas trees. But I'm on the lookout for one special object, our Dungarvan vase. And here it is a magical piece of glass that sparkles like diamonds. And it was all made by hand. While so many processes around the world are totally automated, in this industry, it's craftsmanship that really counts. People value Waterford products for the way that they're made, using patience, dedication, tradition and skill. It's the human touch that makes this crystal a cut above. <laughs>